Okay, so Peter in the second Peter um, chapter one verse sixteen, he says, "We did not follow cunningly devised fables, but we made known to you um, the majesty, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ." So he says, "For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty." Um, and what they're, they're talking about is they're saying, look, this wasn't a made-up story, but we're actually eyewitnesses that Jesus is the King of Kings. He is uh, the Son of God, and he is the King, the, the awaited Messiah King the Jewish people wanted. Now, how, when were they eyewitnesses of this? Well, the verse carries on saying, For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. As so, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, so uh, which you do well to heed as a light shines in the dark place. So the, the prophetic word that, that uh, Peter's talking about is when they went up on the mountain in um, Matthew chapter 17, Peter, James, and John, they're on the mountain, Jesus transfigures and shines like the sun before them. Um, Moses and Elijah appear and they start talking. But then when Peter starts talking, a cloud of glory, the, a cloud of the glory of God comes over and the father speaks, this is my beloved son. So he hears this voice coming from the cloud of glory and he says the prophetic scriptures have been confirmed. and. Peter, James, and John are eyewitnesses of that event. Now, what prophetic scriptures is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the one in Psalm 2. In Psalm 2, if you jump over to that quickly, you'll, you'll see that um, David is writing a psalm, and it is a messianic psalm. In other words, it's a prophecy about the Messiah. So God had promised that on uh, the throne of David would be eternal and it would not come to an end. So there will there will come someone who sits on the throne of David after David and his reign will never end. So the Jewish people were waiting for this Messiah who was going to be king over Israel who would come. and they But they didn't have a, a full understanding of what this meant. Anyway, Psalm 2 says, um, verse 6, Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I'll give you the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession. So in this verse, it, 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 it talks about that there will be on a, on a mountain, on a holy hill, there will be the Lord said to me, there will be a voice coming from the Lord saying, you are my son. And this is saying, and it starts off saying, I've set my king. So the prophetic word is, the, the king will be declared as the son of God on a mountain. And this is what James, Peter, James, and John noticed. If you carry on with the verse, uh, he talks about you shall break them with, with a rod of iron, dash them pieces like potter's vessels. Um, and then in verse um, 12, it says, kiss the son, lest you, he be angry and you perish in the way. So the son of God is being declared in the psalm uh, uh, that you are my son. And on this mountain, I'll declare you as king. And um, Peter, James and John saw that and they, they understood that that was prophetic of the Messiah. And then when Jesus is on the mountain and he shines in all glory glory and light, transfigures, and the Father says from the glory cloud, this is my beloved Son, they said this is the prophetic word being confirmed. Um, so basically that was Peter using the prophecies in the Bible to confirm the Old Testament prophetic word. So who is the Gentiles didn't really understand that it was the Jewish people were expecting a king. Um, but Christ, uh, the Jewish people, uh, though 
were expecting a king. They um, didn't know, though, it was, uh, they know it's the son, but they didn't un have an understanding of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit being the Trinity. Even though in the first v verse of the Bible, uh, it talks about God creating the heavens of, in the earth, Elohim creating the he heavens and the earth. And Elohim, God, the word God, in Hebrew is uni plural. It is, it is a plural word, meaning more than one, but it's uni, that means there's more than one in one. So even the very first verse of the Bible, the word God, God created the heavens and the earth. God is uniplural. That means many in one. So, yeah, it even implies that God is uh, is more than just one. He is one, but more than one. So it implies that in that verse. But the Jewish people didn't quite understand that. Um, so when the next verse is in Genesis, it says, and the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters. So the Holy Spirit is there. When God speaks and light comes out, that is Jesus, the word of God, proceeding from the mouth of God, proceeding out of God. And His when, when God spoke and the Lord, the word comes out, it creates all of this universe. The word proceeding forth from the mouth of God created this universe. Um, in that very, very, very first word, um, verse as well, there are two letters that aren't translated into the English translation aleph and tav which is the same as the alphabet uh, a and z in english or in greek the word, letters are alpha and omega so in that very first verse there is these letters aleph and tav so if you read it it says in the beginning aleph and tav god created the heavens and the earth and john in one what john 1 1 says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, and the word was God. And he goes on to say, John goes on to say, that the word became flesh. So John knows that God is has manifested himself as the word of God that proceeded from God, creating creation, and that um, he has now become a man. So there is the mystery of the deity of Christ, Jesus, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit working together to create this creation. Um, Jesus is the Isle of Tav, or the Alpha and Omega, and in Revelation, he declares that. He declares, I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He makes it very, very clear. And so to the Jewish people who can read it in their scriptures, they would be able to see that the Alpha and Omega, or Aleph and Tav, is the, is the God who created the heavens and the earth. And so they wouldn't have any doubt of who he is so if you go to revelation chapter one it's got verse 11 it says i am the alpha and omega the first and last so this is jesus declaring i am the the person in genesis 1 1 i am the alpha and omega or aleph taf and there's so there's no doubt at all in the hebrew mind that he is not god um and he is declaring on himself um, what you find is the scriptures, all of the scriptures point to Jesus. It is like the word of God has come to us so we may know who God is. Without the word of God, we wouldn't know when a demon or a spirit is from God or from Satan or if there is even good spirits or bad spirits. We wouldn't know because if any angel or spirit came to you and said, I'm, uh, I'm telling you the truth. Well, how would you know it's telling the truth? So a lot of people who don't believe in the spirits or spirit world, maybe they're evolutionists, they believe in evolution, they will think, oh yeah, the universe is all there is. So if a spirit comes and talks to them, they'll be shocked. Oh my goodness, there are spirits. They won't know though anything about, is it telling me the truth? Is, it, is this real? Should I worship it? So without the Bible, the word of God coming to us, the scriptures, we would be um, lost because we wouldn't be able to discern between spirits. We wouldn't be able to discern if, if this God is true, is the creator, is the real God, or is this religion true or the, this religion true. So God had to manifest himself in the flesh as the word of God to confirm the word of God.
The word of God gives us the truth and then confirms himself by coming in the flesh so we can recognize that the scriptures are pointing and talking about him who's come. The word of God has confirmed itself by Jesus coming. And as I said, if we didn't have that, we wouldn't know what is truth. Paul writes in Romans 16, the mystery that has been kept secret since the world began. There is a mystery that's been kept secret since the beginning of the world, but has now been made manifest. That means made, been uh, shown, so people can see it, by the prophetic scriptures made to all nations. And what is this mystery? If you read earlier, Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret. The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation is the mystery being revealed. That Jesus is the Messiah, is the Christ, is the one who created all of this all of this uh, world. Um, and he is the mystery being that was uh, kept secret since the beginning of the world, but has now been is now been revealed. In Colossians chapter one verse twenty six, it says the mystery that has been hidden from ages and generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Okay, so there is a mystery. God is God is willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery amongst the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So not only has the prophetic scriptures revealed God, they've shown that this God, this Christ, this Messiah is Jesus, and he wants to dwell in you. That is at the hope of the Gentiles, that the Holy Spirit, would, the hope of glory would dwell in you. Christ within you is the hope of glory. Um, all things um, were created by him and through him and for him. You read Colossians chapter 1, verse um, end of 16, uh, sorry, yeah, end of 16, it says, all things were created through him and for him. And that's because God, Jesus, remember, is the word of God that comes out of God, and they are they, they are one being but three, L-O-M, a, a uni plural word. So the God who created creation has tried to reveal himself. So we have we we've seen the prophetic scriptures. We can see Jesus has fulfilled this prophecy in um in uh in the book of Psalms. When we come to um the church coming uh, coming around, because the 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 hope the hope is that the church would be um the of the Gentiles is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So if we, we let's have a look, let's explore that hope. Uh, let's go to Romans um, chapter chapter eight. Um, let's go. Let's have a look. Um, yeah, Romans chapter eight. Yeah, verse uh, verse. We'll read verse. Um, we'll read verse nine. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So we have to have, it says, the spirit, his spirit dwells in you. It must dwell in you if you are to be saved. We were uh, tying it back to Adam and Eve. When Adam, Adam was uh, when God breathed life into Adam, he became a living being. So if we jump over to Corinthians chapter fifteen, it says, uh, verse forty-five, First Corinthians fifteen, verse forty-five. It says, "The first man, Adam, became a living being." When God breathed life into him, he became a living creature, a living being. But later on it says, and he in verse 47 it says, the first man was of the earth, made from the dust. The second man is from heaven, is the Lord from heaven. So those people who are made from Adam's seed, the dust, the curse is, you're, from dust you came to dust you shall return. 
But the heavenly man, who Jesus, who came from heaven and was born from a virgin, those who were born from him, born again from him, his seed from heaven, because we have to receive the implanted seed of God from heaven, which is which saves our souls. That's what James says. Receive the implanted uh, word, uh, the implanted seed that will save your souls. So we have to receive that seed from heaven, that not from Adam's generations, his seed, but from the heavenly man. And from heaven we were born, to heaven we shall return. Okay, we're not of the dust of the earth, and we return to the dust anymore. So it says, as we, it says, yeah. So as as was the man of dust, so are those who are made from dust. As is the heavenly man, so are those who are heavenly. And as we are born the image of the man of dust, being born from Adam, we, we have his image, we shall, we shall also bear the heavenly man. Okay, so we are going to get one day a transfigured body, like Jesus did on the mountain, we're going to be, receive one. And But you still have to be temples of the Holy Spirit, even though we are in clay vessels right now. We're in an earthly tent that is in the image of Adam, but we now receive the image of God through the born-again seed from God. Jesus said, uh, you must be born again, and that word means from above. So you must be born again from above. Receive the heavenly seed from above. For a Jewish person, uh, for a non-Jewish person to become a Jew, they had to be baptized in water. That was how a non-Jewish person became a Jew. Um, so baptism has always been part of their entry into salvation for the Jewish na uh, Jewish people, non uh, for the for the Jew and the Greek. Um, the Jewish people, when you became a priest, you must be you had to be baptized, washed with water in the laver bowl, and so Jesus was baptized uh, uh, for the ministry. Yeah, so. So we are, we are called to be the hope of glory as Christ within you. Um, it, throughout the Bible, it, God has shown about how, how people worship him in temples. And Paul says we are temples of the Holy Spirit. And when you look at temples through the Old Testament, you see that uh, they are examples of what we are now. Priests and kings operating in a priestly ministry and also as um, um, temples filled with the Holy Spirit. So let's let's read about some of the mystery that is hidden from most people when they read the Bible. The mysteries. So the, one of the mysteries is um, in the book of Acts chapter 1, it said in verse 15, Peter stands up and he's in the midst of the disciples and there's, there's 120 of them. Okay. And they're all in one accord. And they have, they're all, it says they're all in one accord. And uh, in chapter 2, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And then the, a sound from heaven of a, as of a mighty rushing wind, it filled the whole house and they were where they were sitting, and they appeared divided tongues of fire on their heads. Chapter 2, verse 1, and uh, 1 to 3 there. Now the tongues of fire, tongues of fire, it says they were divided tongues of fire, divided. Now that represents when the nations were divided in Genesis chapter 11. So when God saw that the nations were, uh, the, the people were all in one accord in one place, um, and they were building this big tower up to heaven, maybe they were trying to by their own works reach heaven. And God doesn't want us to try and reach even by our own works. He wants us to trust in Christ for, for us to go to heaven. So anyway, the people of the earth are building a great town to try and reach heaven. And he says, no, they're all in one accord. They're all in one language. One, you know, We need to divide them. So he separates them and divides them by tongues. And the word Babel means confusion. So at Acts 2, we have the same tongues of fire, the divided tongues of fire coming on the believers and everyone in Jerusalem hearing the believers speaking in other languages, other tongues. Because in the church, there is unity. Where there was division amongst all the nations, 
because of Babel and the tongues, divided tongues. In the church now, with the Holy Spirit being uh, given to them, they are now united. There is unity in the church. All the nations, all the languages are now uh, one in the church. There is unity. And where there is unity, God commands a blessing. Okay, And the blessing is the Holy Spirit being poured out. So there is unity. Um, it even says the people who heard them in Jerusalem, heard them speaking their languages, other tongues, they were all confused. So we can see that confusion and Babel means confusion. We see the Jewish, uh, when the Holy Spirit's poured out, there is confusion amongst the people hearing languages spoken, but there is unity in one accord. But in both places, they were in one place and in one accord. Okay, So these are parallel prophecy scriptures. Old Testament showing how division happened in the world and New Testament where the Holy Spirit's poured out and bringing unity to the body of Christ. The unity of all nations. The other thing that happens is it's tongues of fire. Now, in Second Chronicles chapter 7, it talks about when the Holy Spirit is, um, uh, sorry, when they're dedicating Solomon's temple, he builds a temple to worship God. In Chronicles, it, it said they're all uh, they're all there, and let's let's read it. Okay, so when Solomon had finished praying, this is when they're building the temple at Sol Temple of Solomon. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and sacrifice, and the Lord of Glory filled the temple. Now this is the dedication of the temple. So Solomon's temple is being dedicated by fire, just like the church is being dedicated by fire as being the new temples. And just like in Solomon's temple, if you pop over to 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13, it said there are 120 priests all in one accord. Uh, chapter, it's, it's chapter 5, verse 12 to 13. It says there's 120 priests all in one accord. And then the temple is dedicated by fire. So we have in both passages, we have 120 believers all in one accord and then fire dedicating the temple. So the, uh, when the Gentiles are preached the word of God through Peter, Cornelius and Cornelius' household, they receive the tongues and the, fire, uh, the, the Holy Spirit being poured out and they start speaking in tongues. And Peter goes, oh, we need to baptize them. Okay, because baptism and fire, baptism and the spirit being poured out are two and uh, happen in, throughout the whole Bible, right through. They're, they're consistent. So Jesus dies on the cross. He brings, through his suffering, he brings many children to the Father, just like the curse. The woman was cursed with suffering to bring forth children. He takes our curse. Um, just as the earth was cursed to bring forth thorns, he wears the crown of thorns. And just as Adam was put in the ground, it was said, from dust you came to dust you shall return, shows that the Christ would have to suffer to bring forth children unto God. He would wear the crown of thorns, and he would have to go from Dust you came to dust you shall return. You would have to break the curse of death by dying and then rising again. So in those curses is a, is, hit, is a prophecy showing them what the Messiah, who the Savior, would have to do to redeem mankind. So when Adam and Eve sin at that tree of knowledge of good and evil, Jesus has to die on a tree. When Adam is from dust you came to dust you shall return, he has to go. The Messiah has to go to dust to break the curse but then rise again, because he is from heaven, not from the dust. So Jesus takes on all the curses on the tree, which is the cross. The knowledge of good and evil represents the law, laws to God and laws to man. So He, Jesus dies on a cross, which is the symbol of laws to God and laws to man. The symbol of vertical and horizontal law. And his blood covers that law. Now, in uh, the Old Testament, when Moses built his, uh, the, um, got the law, he put it in a box called the Ark of the Covenant, and it was inside that box, and on top of it was a mercy seat, a gold slab, 
And every year the high priest would go in and sprinkle seven drops of blood on the mercy seat. The point is, the law which the people had broken was in the Ark of the Covenant, was in there. The law had been broken, but the blood was on the mercy seat and it atoned for their sins. It, the blood covered the law on the mercy seat. And Jesus on the cross, his blood covers the law, the cross, which is the symbol of the law, his blood covers the law. But the blood of bulls and goats were, are temporary animals of this earth. They are of this realm, they're temporary in nature. So Christ's blood, and they could only atone for sin under the law, over the top of the law, covering the law for a year. But Christ's blood is eternal. That means Christ has to be eternal to be an eternal offering. So Christ had to be eternal, an eternal offering, which means he had to be eternal, which means God had to come himself, who is eternal, to die for us to cover the sin. Okay, it is, only his blood could cover for eternity. And how can you unite mankind back into God? They had to be born again and receive the seed God inside them, the Holy Spirit filling us. So we've become temples. Now, since we're temples, we are actually now priests of the temples. Um, there is a mystery. Okay. There's a lot of mysteries, obviously. But one of them that's very interesting, which I don't think a lot of Christians understand, is in Ephesians, um, when Paul talks about that, Paul, Paul talks about in Ephesians uh, uh, about a uniting, a uniting together, okay, of the two becoming one. He's talking about the Jewish people and the Christians becoming one, two becoming one. So what is he talking about exactly? I'm just trying to find Ephesians. Let's just have a look in there. Galatians, Ephesians. Yeah. Okay, this is good. This is going to be good. This is going to be interesting. Uh, could be controversial, but it could be interesting. When when God was speaking to Abraham about his descendants, he said, look, look at the stars in the sky. And he tells him to look up and count the stars. He says, you're going to have descendants like so many, like that. And then he says, look on the ground, count the sand on the ground. Uh, sand, you know, sand on the ground. Your descent is going to be like the sand, sand on the ground. Uh, just so many. In a spiritual sense, God is speaking to Abraham that his descendants are going to be of two types. Physical descendants of the sand of the ground, which are the Jewish nation, that represents his descendants coming from his loins being the sand, and spiritual descendants being the stars in the sky, which is those who will inherit salvation through Christ, and they are of a spiritual nature. Now, Abraham's descendants uh, create uh, get the, the the temple sacrificial system. They 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 build temples and they have a uh, priesthood, and that has uh, Abraham's descendants, and they create a priesthood and temples. Those are all earthly and temporal. So that means the temple system is uh, the uh, the Levite priesthood and all them. They're all temporal of the earth, of the sands of the earth. But the heavenly ones, there is also a priesthood and a temple. But they're eternal. So Jesus comes to fulfill the earthly um, seed, the seeds, made, the, pro the prophetic things in the priesthood of the earthly um, seed and he also is the heavenly one because he's come from heaven and he institutes a, an eternal priesthood which is greater than the earthly priesthood so he makes an eternal one in the order of Melchizedek without end beginning or end and eternal in nature it's like he swallows up the earthly one but there is still the priest's the priests are eternal, remember, in the heavenly priesthood one. There, there's eternal priest. So when we become temples of the Holy Spirit, you are in, you are entering into an eternal priesthood in nature. So let's read about 
so that when so when you see the prophecy what well, god speaking to abraham about his seeds he's sh he's talking about heavenly and earthly seeds there and both of them have sacrificial system and temple and priest jesus becomes the high priest of the eternal and he is the sacrifice and he is the sacrifice for the earthly and the heavenly because he's eternal so when we read in um let's read ephesians you re think about it very carefully blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places because we are heavenly born and become a heavenly priesthood in him we're heavenly temples of the holy spirit he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, um, according to his good pleasure of his will. Yep, um, carry on. Um, verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, so at the correct time and in, uh, in the fullness and correct time he would gather together in one all things in christ so in the fullness of times he would gather together all things in christ both which are in the heaven and which are on the earth okay see how it's a combining of the heavenly seed and the earthly seed is happening here and we have in him we have also obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of his will so there it's, it's trying to show you there's a heavenly and earthly and he's bringing both together in christ the earthly seed the heavenly seed both priesthoods all being united in christ um if we go across to chapter 2 verse 14 um it talks about the uh, up uh, before that it talks about the gentiles who are not part of the nation of israel and they're strangers and alienated they have no promises of, from from god uh they're far off but it says we've been brought brought near by the blood of christ for he himself is our peace he has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments concerning ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two making this peace and that he might reconcile them both to god in one body through the cross so he has basically put the all uh, the earthly and the heavenly uh, seeds all together in him who is the seed of promise and we are all united in him so there there's uh, a mystery there that you hopefully understand being revealed now you might be when you look at the the abraham seed the seeds of the sands who create this temple system they're all prophesying about jesus too because Moses, when he's asked to build, here is the temple system, the, the worship system, the tabernacle I want you to make for the people of Israel to worship God. He tells them, Bill, get six pieces of furniture and lay them out in a cross. The way to the Father, the way to the glory of God, into God's presence to worship him is through the six pieces of furniture in a cross okay the six pieces of furniture represent jesus um the through the cross the six the number six represents man man where, where man is made on the sixth day so the six pieces of furniture in moses's te temple is saying there is a man and it's laid out as a cross so the only way to the holy of holies the Shekinah glory, which is the tangible presence of God. God's presence where he fills the temple and they cannot stand because of the power of the glory 
the physical power of the glory filling the temple. They can't stand, the priests can't stand in that glory. It's too, so strong and powerful. The way into that physical presence of God was through six pieces of furniture, man, a man, and a cross. So even Moses, when he's commanded to build this tabernacle or way to worship, he's prophesying through his priests, that, through, that, through that temple, about Jesus coming to die on the cross. So that when Adam died, on, uh, Adam sinned at that tree, Jesus would die on a tree. Wooden cross. It had to be in the symbol of the law because of knowledge of good and evil. So Jesus dies on the symbol of the law, a cross. Um, he had to take all the curses. So Jesus is uh, being prophesied through Moses' temple. And even when he's on the cross, it says, from his side came blood and water. And Moses' tabernacle, the, the, the first pieces of furniture that in, in it is blood and water. The blood sacrifice and then the washing of the labor bowl. So Jesus makes the way from the blood and the water coming from his side for us to enter into the holy place in the tabernacle of Moses. In the tabernacle of Moses has the candlestick with 66 knobs and buttons and almonds and bowls. So there's 66 of them. And that represents the word of God, the 66 books of the Bible. And it's shining, the, the, it's the, 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 the menorah, the lampstand, with the 66 knobs and buttons, almonds, bowls, representing the word of God, filled with the oil that shines light in the holy place. So we have the word of God, Jesus, he is the living word of God, shining on the bread of, it's called the bread of presence, or shoe bread. And so the word of God is being illuminating on the bread from heaven, who is Christ. Now that bread that the priest had to eat was sprinkled with frankincense. And Jesus is prophetically the bread of heaven. He is the bread from heaven. He was given frankincense prophetically by the wise men at his birth. He was given a present, and that was prophetically saying he is the bread of heaven because he was given frankincense as a present. So he is the bread of heaven in the holy place. And we are to partake of him. We are to receive a revelation from of the word of God shining on the word of God. That's our Rima word and our Logos word. And so Jesus is the furniture in the holy place. But it says in Hebrews that he is actually um, the veil that separates the holy place from the holy of holies. And so you remember there's the earthly temple, uh, tabernacle or temple. And then there's the heavenly one. So there's a real, Moses is told to make the copy, a copy on the earth, temporal one, because there's a heavenly eternal one. And it says Jesus is the veil that separates us from going into the holy of holies. He, his flesh is now the veil. So when we're in Christ, we can now enter into the real tabernacle, holy of holies, which is the real presence of God, physical presence of God. You are priests. Your temple is filled with the Holy Spirit. But you're also uh, you're the temple and you're also the priest and you are to offer up praises of worship offerings and sacrifices of praise that is part of your priestly ministry you you do a wave offering which is a joy offering you clap your hands that is an offering you give money that's an offering everything is is a priestly duty now uh, is we are now being anointed as kings and priests and we are the temple as well it's eternal in nature we are now heavenly priests um we are allowed to experience so this is the number one thing I want you to take away is we have firm confident prophetic confirmation that Jesus is the King of Kings. He is the King. I've said on the royal hill, the glory cloud has said, this is my beloved son. We know he is the Messiah, the King. His mission was to undo the curse and save mankind from the fall of Adam. So he took upon all that on the cross. He, he wanted to redeem mankind and bring them into uh, sonship so we could be sons of God. So we have to receive the Holy Spirit and become his temple, his dwelling place. You need to be baptized into him, into united into him. That is part of it. Don't think you don't have to be baptized. You must be baptized in water 
to be baptized new, fresh again into his body. Baptism by water is how he showed you. He did it in his first miracle where he turned the water to wine. They were clay pots and they were for legal ritual purposes. He filled them with water, which represents these clay pots. There's six of them. So it represents man. Water, he fills them with water and then he turns it into the presence of God, Holy Spirit, wine. But the, 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 these, these water clay pots were all wrapped up in legalism. He turns what is legalistic and ritual into the uh, vessels that contain the wine, the new wine. We are the clay pots, the six pots, the ritual ones before we say we're the ritualistic ones. He wants us to go through water and and the spirit. So just as he's baptized into his priesthood through water, as all priests had to, we're baptized into our priesthood through water. Throughout the whole Bible, baptism by spirit and water goes right through. It's a common theme. Uh, the whole universe is baptized in water. It comes out of the waters of the deep. It says the Holy Spirit is hovering over the waters, and out of that waters comes the creation. So we have water and the Holy Spirit. Then the earth, when it's flooded, we have the earth all totally full, covered in water. And it is the judgment, the water is covering the earth. And the, uh, the only place you can be saved is in the ark. And the, the Holy Spirit comes as a dove to the place, the only place of salvation, the ark. And the ark represents Christ. The ark's made out of wood, so it represents the cross, but it is being in Christ, the ark. He is the, he is the saviour. So the ark, the Holy Spirit, the dove comes back to the ark holding an olive branch. And that is the olive, from the olive tree is where we get the anointing oil, the anointing. So when Jesus is in the water, he is, the Holy Spirit comes as a dove and anoints him because he is the ark. He is the savior of the earth, the only place of salvation. You must be in the ark to be saved. So you must be in Christ to be saved. Um, you must be in the body of Christ. So the, the dove comes down and anoints Jesus at his baptism, and the dove comes with the anointing branch, the olive branch, to the ark. Remember, there's water, so there's baptism. The whole earth is baptized, and the Holy Spirit's there. So we have the two. The, see, that's twice. So we've got the universal baptism with the Holy Spirit hovering over it. We have the whole global baptism with the Holy Spirit coming as the dove. And then we have the national baptism when the people of Israel leave Egypt and go through the Red Sea. But when they enter the promised land, they also have to go through the Jordan. So that's another water baptism. So the whole nation of Israel go through two baptisms in this case, through the Red Sea, and then they all die off in the wilderness. So the next group have to be baptized and they go through the Jordan. But the Holy Spirit's always there. He's a cloud, he's a pillar of fire, and he is a pillar of fire that leads them. So he is there in, in, in those cases. He is at present in the universal baptism, the global baptism, the national baptism. So when it gets down to the individual baptism of the priests, Jesus is baptized as a, in, in, in the Jordan, he is a priest. He gets baptized into his priesthood, priestly ministry, and receives the anointing, the Holy Spirit. There is the fire. He asks us to also become new creations. So just as a mother is birthing her children and the waters break when she has a, is birthing a child, we have to break the waters. We must go under the water and break the water and come up. None of the sprinkling with water on the head, that's nonsense. You've got to go under the water and then come up and break the water and be birthed again. But it is the baptism out of that water when we come up, we are becoming new creations. It's like creation was made out of the waters with the Holy Spirit of hovering. We come out of the waters and we become new creations in Christ. And we receive the Holy Spirit as our uh, temples, full, full, to be filled as temples. Um, it cuts off. When they went through the Red Sea, the enemy was cut off from them. It cuts off our past. It cuts off our, the enemies. They have no access to our lives anymore because they are drowned in the waters of baptism. The old man, the flesh is drowned in that water, in the baptism, 
baptismal waters. Um, the scriptures say that baptism is circumcision. Um, so what what they are talking about there is in circumcision is um, Moses was told, uh, you know, he tried to, he was told you can have um, descendants. So he tried to, by his fleshly understanding, tried to have descendants to fulfill the promise God had given him. He said, yes, I'm going to give you a Sarah, a, a son, a son of promise which is prophetic of Jesus being born as a son of promise, um, just as um, Sarah couldn't have children, so it was a miraculous birth. It's prophesying that she is like Mary, who had a miraculous birth. So it's showing the prophet, uh, it's, it's prophecy that there would be a miraculous birth of the promised one. Um, yeah, so so that, that, that that's what's happening there. So um, Abraham is told not to trust in his flesh, but to cut off that part of the flesh that he trusted in, that he must trust in God and not in his flesh. So he's told to circumcise himself and his descendants. That's saying not trust in his fleshly way to receive the promise of God. Now, baptism, it is also a prophecy that from his loins, the Messiah, the one who would would be the heir of promise, would be cut off. That means it's it's prophesying the, the death of the Messiah coming from his loins. A bit hidden, a bit hard to understand, but the circumcision points to Christ's death on the cross as being the one who would be cut off for us, that we wouldn't trust in the flesh, but in Christ. So when we are circumcised, so it says in um, Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism in which you were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So circumcision is about not trusting in our flesh. So when we are baptized, we are being buried in Christ and being united with him in his death, and we're trusting in his death and resurrection for us. So we are baptism is our circumcision. When they were circumcised, they were given a name, and it says in Hebrews, you were named by the family of God, after the family of God, you were named. So when were we named, given that name, that heavenly name, heavenly family name? You were given that when you are baptized, because that is when at circumcision a person is named. We're baptized into the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or the 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 full deity of Christ, the, the declaration of the whole Trinity. The Lord Jesus Christ. There's the Trinity there. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So we're baptized into the Trinity, into the Father, Son, the, the family of God. That is when we're named. Okay. So remember, Jewish people name their children at circumcision. Uh, name the male children at circumcision. So when we're circumcised, which is our ba is baptism, we're baptized into Christ, who is the one who's done all of it for us. We're not trusting in our flesh anymore. We've been buried. Our flesh is being buried and united in Christ's death. So we're united with him, and we're raised with him in resurrection power. So baptism is our circumcision and our naming, heavenly name, uh, where we get our family, uh, named in the family of God. Read Ephesians about that. So we are to trust in him. We're dead in our trespasses and uncircumcision of our flesh, but he is our circumcision for us. He's the one who was cut off for us at the cross. Um, yeah, so uh, hopefully you can see that that is the individual baptism. There's a universal baptism with the Holy Spirit. There's a global baptism. There's a national baptism. There is a priestly baptism. Which, uh, uh, which is an individual baptism, which we are to uh, partake of to um, enter into our, our priestly roles. Jesus said, go into all the earth and preach the gospel to all mankind, baptizing them. Okay, so that is what he wants us to do. Some people think, oh, if you receive the Holy Spirit, you don't have to be baptized. No, because even the Jewish, uh, the non-Jewish Gentiles, when they received the Holy Spirit, 
Peter knew straight away, as soon as he saw them receive the Holy Spirit and start speaking in tongues, he said, well, who can for forbid them now to be baptized in water? Who can forbid it? Because he realized that, that that is how a Jew Gentile person becomes uh, uh, saved or born again was through water baptism. So he he recognized that and said, we, we should really baptize them with water now. There isn't anyone really in the Bible that in the New Testament that hasn't been baptized. Um, the only person, when Jesus said, oh, you'll see me in paradise to the thief on the cross, you've got to understand that that thief on the cross is being baptized into Christ's death at crucifixion. So we're symbolically in the water, we're baptized into Christ's death and into his crucifixion. When we're buried under the water, we're we're circumcised with Christ. We're we're buried with Christ in his in his crucifixion. The thief on the cross is being literally crucified with Christ. So we're symbolically being crucified with Christ, but he was literally crucified with Christ. So he had a literal baptism into the into the birth, into into Christ. Okay, literally. So everyone was baptized. Everyone. There's no exceptions in the Bible. And when Paul talks about baptism, he has a whole chapter on it, and then he says later on, anyone who confesses with the mouth and believes in their heart that Jesus is Lord will be saved. He's not undoing the chapter he just wrote about before. He's not saying everything I just wrote about you don't have to, you can ignore. He's talking about in context that being united in Christ's death and resurrection is part of it. Okay. So every person in the New Testament, you notice as soon as they hear the gospel and get saved, they usually get are baptized straight away because they see it as part, one and the same thing. I'm gonna, I want to get saved. I want to be born again. I, I need to be baptized. I need to be united with Christ. I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when you look at all the baptism through the whole Bible, you realize it's a consistent message of the Holy Spirit and baptism. Anyway, hope um, you receive some encouragement. Faith that the prophetic scriptures are um, there and uh, you, you receive a lot of faith from them. And be refreshed and encouraged. You have the truth. You are priests of the whole mighty, uh, the, 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 you're eternal priests. You're allowed to enter into heaven itself, into his temple, into his throne room. You're allowed to press in through the veil into his physical presence, which was not available before only one high priest once a year in the jewish temple was allowed to go into the physical presence of god now you are priests and temples you are filled with the holy spirit you're allowed to go into his presence and it is your inheritance to feel manifest power and presence of god you are just you are temples filled with the presence of god the glory of god lives in you he has every gift in you he can manifest through you to the world around you his glory okay, just as jesus was glorified in front of his disciples we also can allow the glory of god to start to manifest through us to affect around us by his presence breaking through us because we are temples when the presence of god is strong in the temple you can't function okay so the more power of God coming manifesting physically into this realm for of the power of God uh, the less we will be able to maybe do things in the flesh because the flesh can't handle that it's 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 way too powerful that we're, we need a new body that's why we're going to receive a new body because the full presence of God manifest presence of God will just mount our flesh we can't stand in it we need a transfigured body a new body to be given to us, uh, that we can stand in the full measure and power of God. But you, um, you, 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 you are the ones filled with the power of God in the temples, and you, the Lord can break out through you with miracles, signs, and wonders. He is the same God of the past. Every miracle in the Old Testament is available to you right now. Every new, uh, miracle in the New Testament is available to you because you have the power of God in you living in you so you are capable of whatever the lord wants to do and move through you as priests 
and as his temple and as his children. Okay, well, be blessed. Thank you for, if, if you're listening to this, God bless.